Sound is speeding. Cool. Welcome on, Brian. Very, very, very glad to have you on here. Thanks, Heath. Glad to be here. Uh, so, let's dive in. Let's, uh, like we were talking about, the, the goal is to start with who you are and where you came from. What was your childhood like? And, and specifically, like, uh, impactful experiences or people that came along in your life that helped shape why you think the way you do. Okay. Uh, that's a, a pretty broad question, so I guess I'll start from the beginning. Okay. Um, I'm from here in Atlanta. Uh, I was born in 1978. So I'm 36 now, and uh, love living here in Atlanta. Um, grew up, went to uh, um, Pace Academy, which is right down the street on West Pace's Ferry Road, um, and still best friends with my high school friends, which is, I think, something kind of unique about our group because we're spread out across the country, but we're still great friends. Um, I would say influential people in my early childhood, my mom and dad, of course. Um, you know, my mom's... Uh, a really outgoing and personable and fun loving person she sung with up with people uh, when she was young and traveled the world and did with that my dad's a surgeon he's wow. you know I could you could say he has a bit of a God complex you know as a, you would want a surgeon too but yeah he's a he's a wild man a maniac he flies a helicopter to work every day um, just kind of a go-getter so it's funny because I would say I'm the mix between the two you know I have a lot of fun with life but at the same time I I tend to attack things when I want them pretty good. So, yeah. So, yeah um, and I love being here in Atlanta. Uh, what was what was like having a, a dad who flies around in a helicopter and like surgery? Because that's I feel like most people have like nothing like that. Yeah, I think it was a, a little weird actually. You know, when you're a kid, you don't. I didn't think of it as like the coolest thing ever. You know, my dad would take me to soccer practice in the helicopter and like land on the <laughs> soccer field. You know, and everybody's like, here comes the Beagle helicopter, you know. <laughs> and it was just kind of funny. But, yeah, I mean, um, my dad's a, an intricate, you know, a, a different kind of person. And he doesn't like traffic. So, so he uh, flies over it. Yeah, he's got a farm 50 miles south of here, and it takes him 15 minutes to get to work every day. So it's another thing, you know, if he's got a way to attack something and, like, knock it out. He got his helicopter license and got a helicopter, and then he just flies to work every day. That'll do so it. yeah, he's a wild man. When we were a kid, when I, when I was a kid, he used to play this game called Chase the Buzzard in the helicopter, <laughs> which he totally would not do now. No. You know, and my dad, I mean, he's uh, 64 now, but he thinks he's probably like 23. And um, yeah, he used to fly the helicopter around, and you see a buzzard, and he would try to chase it with the helicopter. So he'd fly all around it, and you'd be going, whoa. And it's not a good idea to hit a buzzard. No. And we never did. We never did. But, you know, he was pretty confident. You know, he could, like, auto-rotate it down or something. So, so it's, yeah. It's, it's a, an impressive amount of uh, bravery. Oh, I yeah. guess. I guess you could call it that. Yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah. I, I've noticed that within myself. Like, I've been pushed to doing a lot more extreme sports, like racing motocross or snowboarding and stuff, where it's, you, you could get hurt, but that's just kind of what it takes to be present. And I would imagine for someone who's gone through medical school and, and studying that intensely, like sometimes you just need stuff that can completely bring you back to presence. Yeah, and that's his outlet, you know, and I think everybody needs an outlet. You know, we all focus on what we do, work, your kids, you know, your everyday lives, but there's got to be an outlet to what we do every day. And that is his outlet, you know, he, he works like a madman all week long, and then every day he goes home and he works on his farm. He drives a tractor around, he, he does the hay, the cattle, you know, we have horses as well. So he never really stops, but yeah, that's his way of, of expressing himself, and, and he calls it fun. You know, other people would watch him, and you're like, he's, he, does he ever stop working? You're like, no, nah, he's having fun, you know, yeah. and, um, and that was, he always, uh, we always had a lot of fun with, with adventures as kids with my dad and my mom. Um, he taught me to ride motorcycles when I was five years old, and I started driving a Jeep when I was six. Um, so, you know, I've ridden 500 miles of the Baja 1000 race with my dad and done awesome things like that. So, you know, he's a really intense person, but at the same time finds time to, to, to back away from all that, which is, I think, one of the keys of life. You know, you've got to work really hard to do what you want to do, find a way to enjoy it, but also take a few minutes every day if that's all you get and just enjoy yourself. Definitely. Yeah. I, uh, I recently went to, it's either a Hindu or a Buddhist temple, but it, uh, the name of it was uh, a Mandir, which stands for still mind. 
Hmm. And so the, the whole point was it's a place to go to remove yourself from worldly problems and just yeah. still everything. Which I think, yeah, that's definitely really important in whatever way people yeah. find to do that. You know, there's, there's so much noise in the world. You know, there's so much distraction. Um, in this place? And it, it gets, yeah, but it gets more and more, you know, with technology... Uh, we find ourselves not connecting anymore to the things that are right in front of us. But, you know, people, humans, I mean, we, we need to connect to each other. And it's we're coming up at an interesting time because as we're able to connect more and more through these devices and through YouTube and things like that, um, you know, you actually are in some ways, in many ways, connecting less because do you know your neighbor? Do you know the person that walks by your house every day with their dog mm -hmm. you know the world isn't the world is still the same except now it has further reach but it's interesting that sometimes that means we reach out less to each other yeah of course there's always the flip of that which is uh for some people they're just not in an area that's surrounded by people that they really would love to connect with because they're, yeah. they're aware of their other options yeah. so through this they're able to especially yeah. with the youtube i noticed that with a lot of people that do have the regular youtube channels they've People that would be complete introverts you'd never know about right. like, all over the world, millions of viewers, because they found a way to connect. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it gives people a voice, you know? Mm -hmm. It lets you, from your comfort zone, wherever you are, speak your mind, and I think that's a really powerful thing. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you study in school? Uh, at Georgia, I was a marketing, I went to University of Georgia. Uh, I was a marketing major there, but I was always an actor. I started acting when I was eight years old. Um, another influential person in my life I meant to mention earlier was Dan Albright. Um, he was my first acting teacher with the Alliance Theater. Okay. An amazing teacher. Uh, he had never taught kids before, but um, my, I told my mom, I saw, I saw this commercial on TV, and I was like, Mom, I want to do that. I'd always been acting out as a kid. Whenever she made me eat my Brussels sprouts, you know, I would always cut them in half swallow them and then do an entire dying scene in some <laughs> voice or you know and every time it was different you know and I was having a blast and then I saw a commercial with this kid on and I was like okay I want to I want to do that and um, I was like seven years old and my mom took me to to meet Dan and Dan was like well I've never coached kids before and I was like Dan I gotta do this you gotta give me a shot <laughs> and he was like okay I'll, I'll coach you and, and it was an amazing introduction to the industry um, really you know, I can I count that as school and learning too because I'm still an actor. I'm a casting director now, but um, but having the right influences and learning the right way as a kid is what allowed me to stay in this industry because it is an incredible one to try and uh, not burn out. You know, because yeah. it this it eats most people alive. Definitely. You know, so at, at UGA um, I studied marketing and. Um, I was always an actor on the side, though, you know, so I knew I was like, well, I need something solid to fall back on. Marketing's pretty easy, you know, it's like all multiple choice tests, and if you're pretty good at that, you can mostly get the right answer, so yeah. it didn't attend a ton of class in college, but yeah. I did maintain an A average, so, you know, find a, find a way to yeah. do that. I, I feel like with college, at least my limited experience with it was that it's you can you can get by if you actually decide okay I'm going to do well yeah. set like whatever the minimum amount of work is to get this done yeah and then you can do whatever you want but again you know one of the electives I took was entomology which is the study of bugs and there were 300 people in the class half the class were football players and athletes that never showed up but every day I was in that class in the front row because it was the most interesting class I learned more about the world the earth and how insects rule the earth mm -hmm. uh, than you would ever even know to care about um, but it's it's neat because I can still you know see see little things little bugs around the world and say oh I know you know something about that but you know um, UGA has a lot of different great classes and and I learned a lot there you know um, Definitely. Yeah, I had a blast cool uh, okay so um, are there any other people that helped shape like maybe any uh, people you read about in school or, or just people you interacted with that helped really push the way you think beyond just acting and, um, and your dad and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say my, I, I've talked a lot about my dad, but I don't know why I haven't talked so much about my mom. Um, yeah. My mom is, is one of the most outgoing, pleasant, likable people, and she cares about people more than herself to a huge fault yeah. and, um, and has always in, tried to instill that in me. To, to enjoy other people and to find the positive side of things. 
So, you know, I really only, that's, I'm just covering my mom and my dad and my acting coach. But, you know, I try to learn something from everybody I come across. In, in my world, in, as a casting director, I'm affected by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So I try to really be open. And, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I could, there's so many people that have affected my life that um, I'll probably just remember them as we, as we go in little instances, but Definitely. I don't think I could just list them out, you know, because I mean, I take something from this today, you know, it, every single person can influence you. And if you're not open or vulnerable in what you do every day, then you're not learning. Definitely. And when you're talking, you're also not learning. So it's yeah. listening is important. That is probably one of the biggest things I've been pulling away from acting. Not that I didn't listen before, but just that I am intentionally listening for things. Like, what can I take away from this as a benefit and provide to the situation? Or what can I realize that I need to provide or can provide yeah. after listening? Mm-hmm. So what would you say, because uh, I feel like there's a lot of people, I'm definitely one of them, that because you're listening so much, you get uh, affected by all these things that you come across particularly with all the technology and all the things you can learn about the world and some of it's not great and it can really put you in a tailspin so how how do you deal with that I I don't know if I have a filter you know I'm one of these people that absorbs a ton of information Um, I love world history I love world politics uh, and I love the study of people and it's if you if you block any aspects even people that are wrong, you know, even people that you totally disagree with, if you block them out, then you are um, d- discounting your own. Uh, you're, uh, I wish I could stop and back up. If you block those people out, then you, and you never really have a chance to um, to absorb anything new or different. And everybody's got their own thoughts, you know. And if you don't get affected by other people, then. Mm-hmm. It's hard to communicate, you know, and um, I'm not I'm not sure if I addressed your question at all. No, no, you I, know, I, I've kind of lost in that one a little bit, I think. I, I definitely agree to this extent, though, because you, you have to take everything and you have to accept the world for what it is, not for what you want it to be, but uh, trying to visualize what you would like it to be if your goal is to change it. Yeah. So, uh, so are there other th- things that as you went through life and uh, learned about the world that sort of pulled you out of something that you were focused on at one point and then put you in a new direction? Yeah, I mean, I would say yes, and it's not something for the better. Um, oh, okay. I was, when I was a kid, I was one of those kids that would run up to my parents and say, you're never going to get divorced, right? You're always <laughs> going to be together, right? Yeah. And, and they would say, yes, of course. Well, when I was 14, my parents got divorced. And uh, it was a total blind side, never saw it coming or anything. <clears throat> and it certainly changed the way I had planned. And you're 14, you don't know where your life is going, but it changed my attitude completely. Um, and I actually r- kind of started running with a bad crowd, I guess you could say, which is yeah, the rebel. interesting, I guess. I didn't drink or do drugs, um, but we did, uh, we did blow up mailboxes, which is kind of crazy <laughs> because if you did that today, which please don't do that, uh, would be you'd be a terrorist but you know before 9-11 yeah, yeah. it was um you know offense. it was something yeah it was just a felony you know <laughs> but uh and it, yes we've you know statute of limitations has passed on that um <clears throat> but uh but you know no i you know i really got angry with the world and i think for at least five years i probably tuned a lot of people out and it changed my direction as far and and you know you don't see things coming like that in life but it changed my attitude hugely. And I don't, uh, I was always a really positive kid. And I think I still retain some of the negative tendencies that I gained, you know, that I, I took from that experience, but now I use them to my advantage. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I try to touch on those things a lot because I do believe that the family is the most, empower, most important and powerful thing in your lives. And to be really, really close with your family is the, is the most important thing. So, you know, as my mom and dad have gotten remarried and these things, you realize that life changes for a reason and you can't ever predict which way it's going to go. So, you know, now I can look back on that. Oh, man, I was such an angry kid for a couple of years. <clears throat> but that is that also helped me be where I am now. You know, so I use that, always those feelings inside of me to to know to know what I am now. And it's, it's good to know the negative things about yourself, you know, and, and what you're capable of. And... 
and um, and yeah, it helps strengthen the, the good things for sure. There's a there's a concept I was reading about in an article about how uh, most people assume that oh I'm Christian I do good things or whatever you tell yourself that is the reason that you're a good person and somehow that means that you're always a good person and it's mm -hmm. not it's a constant you have to constantly be a good person if you want to claim that otherwise yeah. it's just a title and it's oof, you can really go down a different road and like like they that have that deluded concept of well, I, especially with uh, guys I notice a lot of I'm a nice guy mm -hmm. and it's it's really <clears throat> just that you you just have a certain perspective and that's okay it's just yeah. not necessarily all encompassing of yeah, reality yeah I, I would say far more what determines if you're a good person or not is is how things affect other people around you that you do rather than what you think you do is make, makes you a good person yeah you know if you can change the world for better and it affects you for the worse you're probably still a good person yeah, yeah. If people don't take themselves out of the equation that much and you know that's I think people are much more tied together than we realize and with the internet and uh, you have the ability to to hear and feel people's point of view that you never had before and um, and hopefully the world will open itself up as we continue this process and not go back in time because right now I think the, the internet and all these things are fighting against each other yeah. You have the freedom to be able to speak to each other, but at the same time, you're not sure if your conversation is being recorded or watched by someone else who's a third party that you didn't really intend to be part of your conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have this idea of freedom fighting the ideas of control, and yep. if the same people control that whole thing, I think you'll end up under control. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes, but I do believe in freedom. Yeah, especially with this whole FCC Comcast thing. It's, you know, two internets. That's an interesting... <clears throat> which one will you get? <laughs> well, and I have, I have uh, been reading about it, and uh, there's, there's a few other perspectives that are interesting, like the idea of having Netflix and streaming full HD to that many people all mm -hmm. through the same tube, if you will, does kind of bog everything down, and, and there is an advantage to having it on a separate uh, tube, so it's yeah. it, it would actually make everything else faster, all the emails and everything, but... To what are you giving up to get that? And yeah, and why? is that what it's really about? I don't, I don't know because I don't know enough about. Right. I didn't build the <clears throat> internet. I think anytime you take companies uh, in consideration, then you need to realize that the most important thing to the company is their bottom line mm -hmm. and security. So until I mean, I don't know about security. Well, like, I think, like as a company, so you can well, keep yeah, making money. Yeah, financial security. There you go. Yeah, that's you know. Um, you know, I don't think when healthcare.gov opened up, security was exactly on the forefront <laughs> of things. You know, yeah. when an 11 year old hacked the system, they were like, oh, this happened. You're like, uh, yes, that's very good. There's yeah. my social. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, anytime there's a company involved, I think you have to ask, who is this company? What is their goal? And wh why is it beneficial? You know, and I, I do think a lot of companies and corporations should be non-profits. There should be no reason why insurance companies should should profit upon people. Um, I don't think that they should be part of government, per se, because anything the government does is the most inefficient thing possible. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but at the same time, the idea of non... There should be non-profit companies for health insurance, for, for car insurance, for, for things beyond just insurance, but, you know... There should be companies that exist for the good of man, and there are not a lot of them. No, and mostly they're strangleholded by trying to raise. I, most nonprofits I come across, and activists I talk to, they're, they're the the model of nonprofit is so inefficient to me because you're spending so much time trying to get money instead of just designing a system that actually functions, just like a business would. Except, you know, have, go like, Tom's Shoes is sort of an example. There's some problems there, but uh, to an extent, that, that concept is great. So sure. If we could do more things like that. That'd yeah. Well, you have to remove hurdles from things like that. We mm -hmm. have to back, you know, regulations are needed on many, many things. But in a lot of things, you got to back away from regulating and let things really, you know, there's mm -hmm. so many obstacles here for... For growth, um, as compared to other countries, uh, that uh, that America is lagging behind in a lot of things. But you know, we 
we fight we fight ourselves you know this is a it's a crazy country yeah i'm i'm curious how it's gonna go now because for the last century or so we've kind of been as america kind of been in a state of really high power Mm -hmm. and now everyone else is rising up to our level and like we're just like you said we're gonna fall behind if we're not competing because we're not yeah and it's maybe not even falling behind as other countries are catching up you know well i mean falling behind like there's there's no reason that finland design and and sweden design this education system that they don't even test anybody till 16 and they're number one in the world yeah come on so you know uh, america's is hypocritical at best (laughs) you know because uh we could bring up a lot more people to be strong and to do what we want to do but i think it starts with the family and education and 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 the home you know and we've gotten away from a lot of great american values and spending time with family and friends and doing things that um that open up your soul And, and america definitely needs a soul check and it's not uh whether you're Republican or Democrat or whatever, we're we're all together, and we there's there's a, I think a clearer way to do things, but people have to listen and be open to each other, and we have to cut out the BS, yeah, because there's a lot of BS in the middle, and I think the best way to do things is is person to person, you know, just have a conversation, you know, even with giving, you know, I like you said, nonprofits and all those things, they have so much so many hoops that they jump through. But, you know, I challenge you next time you want to give something to someone, just uh, find someone uh, on the street or someone that needs a little bit of help, whether it's a dollar or something to eat, and give it to them. Mm -hmm. Because if we all took time to just help each other a little bit, there would be a lot less need for the government to help. You know, we don't need the government to help. You have two hands. You can help people at any time. Yeah, I agree. I've begun thinking of the government not as good or bad but just a certain type of tool that has certain abilities like a hammer can hit stuff or pry or whatever but it's just it is what it is yeah and that should be not i don't want to say a deterrent but like just for us to know that if we don't take care of this on our own preemptively that's what's going to be used and we can think about the consequences of that because you know we have history to show us what will happen sure so yeah i I think we need to just kind of move forward and, and take uh, the power back into our own hands, like decide what we want to do. And yeah. That feeling. But moving that <clears throat> right on into uh, where we are in the present. So what do you, what impacts you in this world? What, what, what like you mentioned family and, and uh, the home and, and that. Yeah. Is, is that the main thing that you'd say we should focus on kind of right now? I don't know. I mean, I'm 36 and i um, I'm single and uh, working 70 something hours a week and I think the biggest thing that impacts me right now is is uh, is having fun with my life and and moving day to day but finding a way to make it a little bit different every day and it's a a little self-centric you know but uh, but I feel like um, right now I'm still trying to to find my place and where I'm going and at the same time seeing how I can help other people you know and then as a casting director, um, I find uh, I, I have to take myself out of the equation a lot, you know, and I and I enjoy other people a lot. Um, but uh, I don't I don't know. A- ask me that question again. <laughs> okay, so let's. I got lost in let's, time there. Let's get uh, I guess more focused. Is there is there a, a specific one or two issues to start with that that are really important to you, like? something that you're noticing going on either in the world, in your community, in your yeah. state, country, whatever, that, that is your yeah. main focus right now. Well, let's talk about Atlanta first. We'll okay. try yeah, to yeah. simplify this a, a little bit for me since I'm a little slow. Um, I love being here in Atlanta. Atlanta has an amazing energy. It's a young city. Um, Georgia's a right-to-work state, so we're seeing lots of businesses move here uh, where the employees are still making uh, awesome salaries. Uh, so Georgia and Atlanta are a place that are kind of forward right now, you know, um, because we are adding so much to the city, yet at the same time, we just lost the Atlanta Braves, and they're becoming the Cobb Braves. I mean, they can still be called the Atlanta Braves for sure, but there is no excuse for that. 
And this city is interesting with as much business and as much energy and young people. More people have moved to the city of Atlanta in the last four years than any other major city in the United States. Mm -hmm. So there's more energy and money moving here than any other city. So it's, it's interesting to see why the mayor, Kasim Reed, can tout all these great things, but when he has to stand in front of the microphone and say, well, we couldn't afford to keep the Braves and the Falcons, so we made a choice. Well, the Falcons play eight home games a year. The Braves play 81. Which one's going to bring more money? It's interesting, because if that's their decision, I want to know the politics behind that decision and how that's made. Mm -hmm. Because as the Falcons are building a new stadium, the Braves, there's, it's being torn down. And the reason it's being torn down is because the city of Atlanta didn't keep up their promise to build up around the stadium. Just like this whole city's building up around it, it's almost like it's building up despite the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Atlanta finally, just a couple years ago, started cutting red tape for the film industry. You know, because Atlanta was the hardest thing to get around when you wanted to film here. We had all this energy to film here, and they were still in the way. So now they're realizing, I think, that they can make so much money off of this that they're starting to get out of the way. But I would like to see the local politicians uh, of Atlanta embrace the energy here so we can build upon the education system, so make schools better here, and make Atlanta a better place to live. And it's an amazing place to live already. We have more opportunity here than most other cities. It's, I mean, we're sitting outside right now recording this because we can. We just had to stop for a biplane, you know, yeah, a few yeah. minutes, but it's just the neatest place. To, Atlanta's a city amongst the trees. You, can, you know, two miles right this way is downtown Atlanta, and it's the most unique place to be. I mean, just, and it changes all the time, and it's growing all the time. But Atlanta is still in its own way, and we still have to figure out a way to stop there from being two Atlantas. Atlanta, uh, an Atlanta where it's disadvantaged and ignored, because it can be, and they don't have a voice, mm -hmm. and the Atlanta that's affluential and changing and growing and moving, like the Beltline. The Beltline is an amazing thing here in Atlanta, but we're way behind on that. Yeah. The company I work with, we, we adopted a, a quarter mile of the Beltline, and we go out there once a month and clean the thing, and, it, and it's just a little part of Atlanta. So I, I don't think it's going to come from the politicians and the people at the top that make change. I think it'll come from the people of themselves here in Atlanta that decide when you walk out, okay, I'm going to take a trash bag and go and clean this up, or I'm going to take this and make it beautiful. We all have that power in our hands. That's so true. despite what the city of Atlanta still stands in our way of, of this growth mm -hmm. uh, with bureauc bureaucracy, we can, we can do this ourselves. That's and true. in a right-to-work state, we have the ability to do that. Absolutely. So that's how I feel about Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And yeah. uh, there's a there's an app they used, I think, in Chicago, and then it got readopted in Hawaii. But what they did is they they marked all the uh, um, fire hydrants all over the city, and then you could adopt one. And it was just saying that you're gonna clean it, and you get to name it, and it's it's a free app. And yeah. uh, so uh, people would it basically if someone wasn't keeping up with their fire hydrant, someone else could like steal it. And then they get to have it. And it's just something like that that makes it fun and easy. We could just apply that to, like, your Beltline thing or yeah. any, anything. It feels good to mm. help and to change little things. So that's when you empower people and take out the anything in the middle and you allow them to go put their name on a yeah. fire hydrant because they Bam. like to take care of their fire hydrant. Make it a game. You I know, mean, it's not. that's fine. It Anything that can make you smile at the end of the day is probably a positive thing. Definitely. Unless you're super evil and that makes you smile. Then... Then that's fine. Kim Jong Un. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, Kim Jong Un is, uh, you know, uh, wait, it's Kim Jong Soon now, right? Oh, is no. there another? No, no. no, it was Kim Jong Il. Yeah. Kim, oh, Kim Jong Un. Soon. Yeah. You know, I'm nervous about them because he's not as much of a movie buff as his dad, even though he does like basketball a whole lot. Apparently. I mean, the worm is over there hanging out with him, you know, things <laughs> like that. But I don't think that's really going to help world politics. You know. No. I mean, the world grow closer together. So. I want to talk about the world a little bit. I think we're in an incredibly interesting, but also very, very uh, perilous time for the world um, because the main thing that has changed over the last eight years, I'll say, is uh, the idea that America is a force in the world for good has totally changed. Mm, yeah. We are now um, basically a non-factor 
uh, and we have no voice for good in the world. Even when we do, we discredit ourselves by saying we're going to do something and then not doing something when people are in need. So critical. the way that affects the world is that um, before when something crazy or something out of line happened in the world, America would stand up and say, we're, we're, we won't stand for this. We stand for freedom. And what, it, what happened was when people would want to do something crazy or do something extreme around the world, America would stop it. Or America would be there enough, strong enough to where countries wouldn't do those things. Mm -hmm. But now with a void of Americanism, uh, you know, um, with, our, with our morals receding, uh, with that void around the world, people see an opportunity. and become more isolationist, there is less of a voice for the small people out there to stand up against the people they can. It started with the, with the Green Revolution in Iran in 2008. Those people had a real close chance to overthrow their government, but nobody in the world stood up for them. And it's not really about America, there's nothing we can do there. But you see the spring, um, the Arab Springs changed the Middle East, the power of Facebook can overthrow a country, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. but. Um, there's also, you know, when Syria gassed their own people and we drew a red line in the sand and then we said we were going to do something about it and didn't do it, that's the beginning of the end of America, people believing in America. Not yeah. here, I still do, but across the world and that's the difference because people see us becoming weaker and weaker so people who wouldn't necessarily have taken a chance to take something that they would have before will do it now. Which is why you see Israel becoming more of a rogue state and more aggressive in what they do. Because as long as they knew America stood behind them, Israel had some security and felt you know, peaceful. But with the Arab Spring and everything crazy going on around them, Israel's going to be as strong as they need to be to stand on their own forever. We don't have to worry about Israel because they'll take care of themselves. You know, and that's a whole other deal. Israeli settlements and all the things they do are not right. It is not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. But um, but to go back to 1967 Arab-Israeli lines, part of Israel would be six miles wide. And if you have Israel be six miles wide and half the people on, uh, or the people on the other side want you dead and their whole existence is about erasing your existence, six miles is not enough space. No. So, you know, when extremism and the voices of extremism and um, uh, when they when they are fought against, which our time is coming where we are going to have to fight this again. It's happening right now with ISIS. You, uh, you, someone has to stand up against extremism in the world. Whether we like it or not, we're the strongest country in the world, so we've been asked to deal with it, and we'll deal with it. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if our president doesn't want to or not. He has found himself in this position, and America has to step in and, and do something to help the world. And because a lot of other countries don't have enough of a backbone to do it. But we do. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing, to seeing us help people. You know, the, the Kurds, um, you know, and the Pashmurga, the people that were getting massacred by ISIS. Um, you know, it's funny how video changes things. Yeah, it's like Ray Rice with the NFL. Or Vietnam. Before they didn't have the before they had you know Walter Cronkite reporting from Vietnam was one of the most powerful things ever. People were actually seeing what was happening, not live, but you know. Yeah, it's like oh, this is first terrible. person. Yeah. yeah. But um, but uh, video you know, videos and YouTube can work both ways. They can overthrow countries or they can awaken a sleeping giant. And I hope that that happens with America because. The people uh, across the Middle East need us, um, and you know, people say, "Get out of the Middle East." Well, we're we're back there already. It's your own fault. It's our own fault. Whatever it is, but it, <clears throat> now we have to own what we've sowed, mm -hmm. and we have to help people. If we don't, yeah. they're going to get murdered. They're by the hundreds of thousands will be exterminated, and it's nobody else is going to stand up for it. That is what America used to stand up for, and we've been forced to do it again. I'm proud to be American and proud to stand up for people across the world who can't do it for themselves. For sure. One place across the world where that's happening right now is Ukraine. Ukraine is a nation that really wants to be part of Europe, but instead they've been thrust back into basically 1960. Uh, Russia is moving backwards in time. Russia is a third world country um, that is, has global reach and all, most of its global reach is negative. 
and they are, you know, I, I pay attention to many, many different um, news sources. I read Russia Today, BBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, Fox News, CNBC, random stuff on the internet, you know, Ukraine's Twitter account. You know, people say, where do you get your news from? Oh, you must be Fox News, you know, and I'm like, no, it's funny, you can get your news source from anything. You just have to be able to filter it and think for yourself. And so I love jumping onto Russia today because they have amazing stories that are mostly absurd. It's, you know, it's their equivalent of Fox News, except it's state owned. And it's, so it's the, the voice of the people for Russia, which is, can you imagine if Fox News was actually the voice of America or the, the mouthpiece yeah, yeah. of the leadership? That'd be the worst thing of all time. Yeah. You need dissenting viewpoints, which, now. which in Russia they do not have. There are zero dissenting viewpoints in Russia. There are two independent media outlets left in Russia. That's it. And they're so afraid to do anything because Russia is one of the top three places in the world uh, where it's most dangerous to be a journalist. So, you know, yeah. it's funny. You can go to Iran, you can go to Venezuela, and you can go to Russia, and either of those, none of those places do you really want to be a journalist, you know? Nope. Because uh, you better agree mm -hmm. if you're going to be a journalist there. You better investigate you know. the way we want you to. Yeah. So I'm very worried about um, the state of Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, obviously, I consider myself a worldly person. I have been to Russia. I studied Russian war history, um, and I've been to Egypt, across Africa, and uh, all across Europe. I've been in South America, and everywhere I go, to, I try to meet as many people as I can to get off tour groups and to go out and meet people and talk to people and enjoy um, life as you go but you watch it deteriorate and watch it move backwards in time in Russia. And it reminds me of, of uh, the way my grandfather described before World War II. Yeah. And both my grandfathers fought in World War II. And um, they were the proudest of Americans and the greatest generation. And they stood up for a lot of great things. And, um, and to hear him talk about the way that uh, things remind him of before World War II with the rise of nationalism and a rise of extremism through nationalism in countries, the world is coming is coming to a very dangerous point. Mm -hmm. Because even though we're closer and closer with the internet and things and business and globalism and all these things, there is still there are still countries that are operating as if they're in a tiny, tiny bubble. And Russia is one of those countries. And we'll see that Vladimir Putin is one of the most evil people to, KGB, to take right? control. Like, He's also, in case we didn't know this, the richest dictator in the history of the world. You know, they think he's worth about $62 billion, which is amazing. You know, if you watch his palaces, which are never reported at all, you know, reported on, not. but he's got palaces across Russia. But can you imagine if you had $62 billion to give to the Russian people? And you might not country. be eating potatoes for lunch, Russia, but you are. Yeah. I've been there. I've seen it. So what? Give me. So it's easy to say third world country, but that's sort of just a title. But since you've been there, what does that mean what, for for them from your experience? Yeah, I mean Russia. I'm sure would freak out at that statement, but you know Russia really uh, it has ma major cities where there's business and there's rich people and a lot of poor people, and then you have rural Russia, which lives just like it was in the 1920s or 30s, and it's made no progress forward. They've left their their people behind. Um, the people have no sense of hope or or future because under communism, at least they all had just a little bit. But under capitalism, the idea of having to work for what you uh, what you're going to earn um, actually defeated that country. You know, in the in the 90s when capitalism uh, grew out of communism, communism fell. There was so much corruption. The actual tax rate was a hundred percent. So oh businesses couldn't even form. You know, and the government would actually just steal it all anyway. So <laughs> they took capitalism, you know, and went the wrong way with it, which was all the way to the all for Cyrus. You know, they mm -hmm. just took it all, basically. And that's where you found them now. They hate capitalism. They hate democracy. And they have a sense of a longing for nostalgia. So Vladimir Putin is anything but democracy. Uh, this is a cat. Hi, this is a cat. Yeah. Uh, d Vladimir Putin... Hello, Vlad. Look, I can ride a tiger, too. Um, you know, democracy, democracy is his enemy, but they like him because he's a strong figure. He makes strong decisions. He stands up for Russian, mm -hmm. Russian principles. And for the first time in a long time, Russians aren't losing to the United States at something. 
So yeah, you know, he calls Ukraine Novo Russia or the Ukraine. If you ask a Russian person, Ukraine doesn't exist. It's just Russia. It's just Russia or the west, eastern, western part of Russia, you know, but uh, I don't know if they haven't checked the world maps, but it's called Ukraine and it's yeah. a sovereign country. But this isn't the first time they've done this. People don't realize that they sliced off part of the country of Georgia and took back what they what they wanted. Uh, and in Moldova, uh, they still have over 50,000 troops uh, waiting to take part of Transnistria, this tiny part of Moldova that they want to take back as well. So unless the world bands together with a common voice against who has become and is a basic thug, mm-hmm standing up for the same things that Stalin and Hitler stood for, unless we have strength together, then the world is about to go the wrong direction. And the problem is the media today cares more about the NFL and a punch thrown than it does about what's going to happen to the shape of the world and our community and how we interact as people. Definitely. So when the media doesn't pay attention, it's to Vlad- Vladimir's... Uh, benefit is to his benefit because he can pull you under the rug beat you up and throw you back out nobody even noticed mm-hmm. and he'll go ride a bear and it's fine and and he, you know and it's funny because he's he did that and then no we're like uh, 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 uh. And right isn't that exactly what so what did? you're seeing is uh, the america used to be a check for the world but right now we have withdrawn to the point where nobody respects or nobody thinks America will do anything. Mm -hmm. So we have become so isolationist and so discombobulated at the top, then people are gonna take their chances now. So we'll see China in the South China Sea. There's a reason we have our Asian pivot and we're trying to help in Asia. Well, when you decrease the size of the military by the amount that you have, then that's probably not gonna be doable because the military is far smaller than it's been in, in a long, long time. You're talking the U.S. military? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Way smaller. And, you know, it's fine. Great. We save money. Call it what you want. But if you're isolationist and you decrease the military at the same time, then there's a great chance that strife across the world is going to grow. If you were the voice of reason and now you're absent and strife across the world begins to grow, you're either going to pull back further and let let it all fall apart or you're going to rebuild yourself a little bit re-announce yourself and help people stand up for what's right Mm -hmm. so as extremism grows across the world and there's a void then who's going to stand up for what's right so who's going to stand up for ukraine just because it doesn't matter to us and we can live a comfortable life here in atlanta i believe that we are more tied together than that and that we should help people people want to be free They want to be able to work, and they want to be able to live, breathe, and die on their own terms. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Definitely. And that's America. America. Anyway. But, but yeah, I I really hope that we find a common voice and find a way to help the world again. You know, but I think in today's sensational media approach and the way we do things, it's not going that direction. You know, but Vice News, things like that. Vice News does a great job of bringing things to our attention. They do. Like TEPCO and Fukushima. You know, that is totally out of control and nobody even knows it. <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a conspiracy theory person, but I pay attention no. and it is what it is. But nobody cares. Yeah. And I don't I don't know if it's just that people have got to the point where they can't handle more than the the bits that they are getting from traditional news or they just don't want to or it's just too traumatizing to even yeah. continue learning. I don't know, but I, I feel like we're at the point where it doesn't matter if you can't handle it or not. It's yeah. happening regardless. It's not going to get better. Yeah. Know, and and that's a great point though. You know, I think think about you can't talk politics or religion with friends, you know, or people anymore because it's too abrasive and it turns people off. Yeah. You know, it's one of the biggest turnoffs ever to talk start talking about Obama or Bush. Mm-hmm. You know, those things are the most acidic concepts possible, but we used to be able to have conversations about these things and not get so fired up and extreme about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's middle ground for everything, but the less we're vulnerable and open to the other side, then the more you push apart from each other. And that's it's happening yeah. more and more every day. Congress and the president can't get together on anything. At all. So we're worse off because of it. 
nobody is the victor. And I feel like there's it's, this terrible sense of duality happening where it's Democrat versus Republican. And no, we 90% of the stuff we actually agree on. It's yeah. focusing on the differences, and we should be looking at the similarities. Yeah. We all need food, water, and shelter without debt across the entire planet. Like, yeah. What are, what are you doing? Well, you should basically, you know, if we had the chance, fire everyone in Washington and start again. Just reset? Yeah, you know, have a reset button. I mean, you know, we could do that with one Facebook page. Mm-hmm. You could you could overtake Washington with one march and Facebook page. They'd have to shut it down. You start up again. Yeah, yeah. With nobody who's been, you know, I think if you're in Congress or you're president or any of those people, you should have to do it for free. I mean, obviously, you pay your expenses, maybe per diem or something like that. But they should or work for just, free. You get, here's the house you live in that has yeah. everything you need taken care of. Oh, yeah. No, I'm saying that. Yeah. But there should be no such thing as a lifelong politician. No. It's a uh, that's idea. not, you know, it used to be people were successful in society or in business or in church, you know, or different th- aspects of society, and those were leaders mm-hmm. that became politicians to further help people, and that is not the case anymore. You are, we are led by career politicians who have nothing but a desire to make it all the way to the top and then do what they want to do or what other people want them to do, yeah. which is kind of where we are now. So Yeah, I, there's a, a phrase you've probably heard that uh, DC is like, Hollywood, but for less attractive people. <laughs> yeah. And I really do feel like they're <clears throat> kind of this this hub of actors that became deluded enough to thinking that what they're acting is real. Yeah. The ultimate method actor. Then. <laughs> At least until, you know, they're, they're uh, people that pay them come along. But yeah. It's kind of an insane concept. You know, it's like... Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's too much. It's a concept. Yeah. Um, Can we pause for a second? I think the people that serve America need to be grounded in in what we are and who we are most and where we came from Mm -hmm. and not deny that. Yeah. You know, my grandparents and her parents are, that is by far America's greatest generation. They went to war, they came home, they raised families, and they made sure their kids had a better life than they did. Yeah. And I don't know if we focus on that anymore. I, well, yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to say because I feel like there's been this especially big thing where uh, extroversion became like the only thing that was ever on any type of media at, or at your teachers, like anybody was extroverted. So if you were introverted, which is just a different way of thinking. Yeah, it was wrong. Not only wrong, but you didn't hear from them anyway. You never got their side of it because they're not out there. Yeah. So I feel like that's just another way we've cleft this uh, society. and. It, not getting the whole story most people aren't on tv most people aren't well presented like actors are and we have this thing called the memory nerve i was learning about so it's like when you watch somebody doing something it lights up your brain the same way as if you were actually doing it so when you watch porn when you watch dramas when you watch horror films like whatever it is yeah if you keep watching that kind of stuff or really uh extremist news like with full of opinions presented as fact then yeah it lights up and you feel like oh it's a fact right no you didn't do the research yes yeah. and it happens within science communities too sensationalism man as long as we sensationalize it it keeps saying it to you <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> i i'm glad you believe that but just because you think feel believe something doesn't make it real <clears throat> and i'm just as guilty of it too like it everybody yeah i want to separate facts and opinions and have people actually present facts reasonably without bias and then present your opinions separate yeah but that's hard to do but sure to, and then i also kind of feel like if you can't do that maybe you should take a break from trying to tell people what's up yeah and that's most of people probably who are telling people what's up yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> the more you're probably telling people how it should be you, you maybe, know. maybe shouldn't be talking. And we all have a touch of that, you know? I mean, yeah. uh, I have to put myself in check a lot, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that's, that's the time when you learn the most, when you, when you listen. And, you know, I know I've already said that, but... No, for sure. That's important. So, let's, uh, let's, let's think future for a little bit. Like, we looked at the past, so we kind of know where we came from, at least from our perspective, and then where we're at. So, looking forward, what do you think are the biggest things that from your perspective we should focus on either at let's just start with Atlanta like as a city what do we need to 
look at and really pay attention to that we're just not. I, I think it's the same story than uh, for a long time. It, it's a ground up uh, kind of movement that needs to happen, uh, and it needs to start with education. Um, and making schools better like you said there's no reason that Finland should be number one in education that's awesome for Finland but we have we have more resources and things here and they weren't and, trying you that's know, the crazy part they weren't no, <laughs> no they just studied a model and figured it out no they're just like you know, well, if we give kids fun and help them figure out what they want without testing them yeah let's just see what happens yeah you know I think if we can have a lot more fun as a country going forward with yeah. each other and and uh take things less seriously but at the same time look at the elemental things that need to be changed and and I really think that starts with with family and education and and uh, making schools better and n making schools not just a thing where you pass you know where you get them to college or get them out of school yeah and that's where we are you know so we're in a really bad place so you know I'm not sure I can't even answer the question if I think government should uh, make schools better or if it's charter schools and private schools that you know if you should privatize the whole thing it's it's you know do we want somebody telling us what we can eat for lunch in school or do we want to have a reasonable expectation that uh, we will eat uh, healthy on our own but when big companies run the lunch programs it's yeah. again you have to think about who benefits the most mm -hmm. and in this case it's it's companies it's Large not kids yeah. eating lunch so, you know, you have to find a middle ground of, you know, of uh, having a piece of pizza but having an apple with it, you know, or something. And, yeah. and we're at such odds with ourselves on how to do that that we either go to one extreme or the other. Definitely. And that's um, unfortunate. It is. And especially when you, like, okay, we know it sucks here. Instead of trying to fight with here let's just take a step back and think about what we do want like let's all get together one spot like what what, what would the perfect system look like not perfect it's not going to be utopia but better yeah. than what we have yeah and we have plenty of models to look at so there's no reason we're not doing it other than we're just not right and there's plenty of people are but i mean i don't know of them yeah the word's not out yet so i'm happy to help whatever way i can but yeah i don't know well i, I think uh for the future you know, this country is either going to go two ways. We're going to let government make decisions, make more decisions for us, mm -hmm. or we're going to take some of that power back and, and empower people to make their own decisions. Um, and not just states, but individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be interesting to see which way that goes. You know, the government wants more and more control over everything that we do. And the Internet is the big, busy, biggest example. You know, putting yourself out there uh, on the Internet shouldn't mean that they are able to go through your emails and go through your uh, everything you say, your conversations, all these things. It Just because you're trying to express yourself and be more open with the world doesn't mean somebody, a third party, should be able to take that from you and yeah. to use it against you. You know, if I have a conversation with you sitting right here, obviously this is not in total privacy, but if, if I had a conversation sitting, uh, speaking privately with you, I should be able to have that exact same conversation 2,000 miles away. Yeah. So why What's can't people trust in the ability to communicate together without someone else utilizing that against you? Mm -hmm. Or for their own purpose of figuring out what you want. Yeah. You know, the only the best person to decide who what what you want is you. Definitely. You know, so I um, you know, you probably figure this out by now. But I'm a libertarian. You know, I believe in the power of helping other people because you ch you choose to. Um, but and I, I I'm laissez faire. You know, hands off from the government. You know, yeah. and regulations and things like death taxes and even property tax. I believe that, you know, if our if the founders saw the way that we're taxed at this point, then they, uh, you know, this isn't it's even insane. the same country. And, uh, you know, the idea of if you buy a piece of land, you've earned the right to own a piece of land, that should be in your family. That should be able to be passed down without paying for it over and over again mm -hmm. with de death taxes and property taxes and, you know, financial gain and all these things. Um, you know, so I think the more money you put back in people's pockets, the more they are willing to help their neighbors and help their communities. And I think you're seeing that in cities like Detroit. You know, Detroit is uh, 
is changing and, and fighting and it's uh, it's honestly a total ground up thing you know with the Definitely. gardens and the communities there changing um, yeah, cuz there were bears and the subdivisions there for a bit There's yeah nothing you know i mean you know <laughs> darkness you know but now they're trying to map out the street lights and it's done by a person who had this idea to fly over the city and chart out the whole thing of where was the darkest and where crime rates were based on street lights and everything and now they simply have turned back on street lights in some of the more dangerous areas and it's cut down crime and it all started because one person said I wonder if there's a correlation between darkness on streets and crime and so he mapped it with cameras from above and he made a difference mm -hmm. which we could now do with freaking drones a yeah you could do it with a drone you know <laughs> so uh, you know that's another thing you know how much airspace do you own above your house? Is it legal for a drone to fly outside your window and, and look at you? Yeah. Or do you own that bit of air outside your house? So we're how are about, you going to enforce that? I don't yeah, know. we're about to, you know, in South Georgia, you just shoot the drone down, man. Yeah. But if it's government property, you might have a problem. Yep. You know? <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions that uh, with the internet age and with the way the world is expanding, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that we'll see, we're going to find out, you know? Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to for say sure. The least. I'm, I I get so lost in all that. There's there's, I, I really feel like there's just too much. Like what we need to do is focus forward on what we want and just have an objective yeah. look together. But to do that, like no one person can learn everything, much less process it and have. You just can't. It's not possible. So how do you how do you get everyone together on the same page and, and yeah. decide what is true and what isn't together? Yeah, and that I mean it's almost a scary concept because there is one entity that in the next twenty years will become smart enough to know all of those things and to change the course of human history, and that is computers. Mm -hmm. And we are going to in the next twenty to thirty years be changing the fabric of. Uh, of what it means to be human and it actually started I think with pacemakers and things back in the day when we started putting machines in our body Definitely. but in the next 20 to 30 years as computers become more and more powerful uh, and become smarter than all the brains in the world then you have the idea of singularity um, which is yeah. a crazy crazy concept you know but as we long to live forever and continually replace parts of our body with machines including microchips in your in your brain and things like that mm -hmm. then uh, we will create a new species and it won't be you know you're gonna in 20 to 30 years it's gonna be interesting to see the haves and the have-nots and yeah, who yeah. is tapped in or turned on to computers and who is becoming one with the system mm -hmm. and one with not and then the question is after another 10 or 15 years after that, when your body is a certain amount computer, are you not just a computer as well? So that's where I think Ooh. the craziest part of, you know, people yeah. don't realize how powerful computers are going to be coming soon. But, that's you lifetime. know, I think, cure, oh yeah, of course, and cure of all diseases and things like that and the ability to live for many, many years past uh, what we are expecting you know originally planned to live for yeah. uh, but that will also drastically change the world and how many how you know many people are on earth mm -hmm. and the resources we utilize and you know if you increase your lifespan by a hundred years then you're also increasing by a hundred years of uh, of consumption yeah, so, and, and you get into real trouble with uh, population growth. So, you know, then it comes to a, a factor of when do we become pests rather than part of the... And, you know, you the, computer will, the computer will probably make that decision in the end to decide if we're pests or not, and then yeah. we'll see what they decide to do with us after that when we created their new species. So yeah. it's kind of a crazy thought, and it's so big to even wrap your head around, but I love thinking about stuff like that because... You watch as 3D arms are made and all these things, and it's changing, you know. I watched a story about this kid in Sudan who didn't have both his arms. The, uh, they were blown off in the, in the war with South Sudan. And um, this guy saw it on TV, and he took a 3D printer over there and 3D printed arms for the kid. And not only that, but he taught the people in the community how to use a 3D printer. So now they're printing each other arms for all the and legs for people who lost limbs in this war. And it's an amazing 
accomplishment of humanity, you know, Definitely. to do this. It had nothing to do with a government or anything. It had this guy who saw it and had an idea, and he went and he helped people. And it's going to help thousands of people in Sudan who have lost limbs. And he empowered them to make a difference themselves. So there's so much positivity to come from it, too. It just depends on where we take it. Definitely. Not to mention everywhere else. There's a, a 3D printer open source group called the RepRap Project. And it's basically 3D printers that were designed to be able to uh, 3D print 3D printers. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> right. So you just go to Africa, show someone, all right, here's the 3D printer, yeah. print them out one, show them how yeah. it works, and then here you go. Yeah. Done. And it's, I mean, say that's exciting, but that's so scary, the idea of, like, self-replicating machines. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's still going into all I know. You still but... plug it in, but eventually, Ooh. yeah, we'll see what, we'll see what, uh, what decisions are made. Yeah, but I think that's just more reason that we should decide what we want to do rather than let ourselves become victims of the future. We have a choice to yeah. drive where it goes, and it, it may get out of our hands, it may not, but I think humanity has shown that we rarely have control over things that we think we do. Yeah, I'd agree, but I, that still doesn't change the fact that there are things we can't control, and we should yeah. at least maximize and know what we can control. Do you think China cares about that? About what? <laughs> China cares about maximizing everything. It doesn't, they, you know, I can't imagine the things they're testing on people and on machines. So, yeah, yeah. as the forces of good and ideas of good are always here, there are going to be people without morals that, yeah. that end up driving this the other direction. I agree. You know, we'll see, because they have no scruples. They could care less, you know. But I do think, like... Yes, it will be quite a day when the walls of China, uh, internet-wise, come down, and really normal walls too, but uh, when that explodes on the internet, but also this idea of all the other billions of people on the planet that don't have internet at all, and once they get internet, that's, we're 330 million, that's like another, what, it'll probably be at that point, 7, 7 billion, billion. 7 billion voices, yeah. all with this level of technology. And I've seen plenty of videos of uh, people giving computers to kids in India with no instruction. It's in English. They don't speak English. And they figured they're it out. They hacked it in like a month. And they're teaching themselves genetics. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. So, I don't know. Between that and where most of the population growth is, is in mostly slums. I mean, if you insert that into there. Yeah. Again, we can use it to empower people. And that's, that's what it should. That's what technology should be. Definitely. To give people... Um, the opportunity to do whatever they want in life and that's like you said just giving somebody an arm or giving somebody a, a tablet that they don't even know how to use can can broaden their reach definitely especially when you make them so simple which you know Apple has its flaws but that's one thing they do really well is make it pretty darn easy to do what you want to do yeah you want to be an artist okay here's iMovie here's iPhoto here's <laughs> photo booth here's whatever you need we got you yep and then Google and everyone else. It's it's impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what about just on a lighter note, you personally? What what do you want to do in the future? I want to travel. I yeah. want to spend time with family, and um, I'd like to find somebody to fall in love with to travel with me. I, you know, mm -hmm. come close several times, but uh, yeah, I love the world and I want to keep enjoying it and as much as I can. I want to get out and, and enjoy people, and uh, I um, I collect old BMWs. I have two old 1989 and 1990 BMW all-wheel drive 325iXs, and I love going on road trips when uh, in the winter with those. Yeah. Uh, last time we had snow apocalypse here in Atlanta, I put my ice driving tires on one of my cars, my GoPro cameras on top of it. <laughs> And I went around and, and dominated this town. I drove around for about eight hours one day <laughs> and watched police crash into each other. I watched a Range Rover and a Porsche crash. You know, all these fun things, but I have tons of fun adventuring. Um, you know, when I went to Egypt, I, I met this guy who's listening to Pink Floyd, and I ended up spending five days with him and his family and just going through all these tiny places in Alexandria, Egypt that no tourist had ever seen, you know, and That's doing some cool. really wild things. And I learned more from that person, you know, about what, why and who they are than you could ever learn on a tour group. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I always try to get outside, outside the bounds, you know, if there's a rope, I try to find myself on the other side <laughs> of the rope, you know, and, um, 
I love to travel and I love people. Uh, one of my goals in life is to is to go to every country in the world. Um, we, That's a lot. we can't do that, you know. Some countries you can't visit, um, but eventually I think. I hope that we see borders uh, diminish, you know. Right now, borders are necessary in a lot of places, you know. Utopia is a great idea, but one person's utopia is not another person's utopia. Yeah. So, you know, um, for now, borders are all over the world, but until we learn to stop shooting at each other, you're probably going to need them. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I'd love to travel the world and, and meet as many different people uh, as I can and and again I want to go to Russia right now just so I could talk to Russians and have a Russian person justify this you know yeah. um, you know and, and justify aggression and it's because you know they their point of view is based on one voice from the top and you know they think where America and the rest of the world are so bad and out to get Russia that whatever comes from their voice from the top has got to be right but yeah. oh, what a sad way to live, you know? You're not, they don't make their own decisions. Still, I'd love to listen to somebody make me believe I was wrong about that, you know, exactly. because I'm sure they probably could, mm -hmm. you know, and tell us why we're wrong with everything. But I have the freedom to travel and to do what I want to do, and a lot of people don't have that across the world. So I, I hope uh, people get their chance to express themselves and whether it's a tablet for a kid in a slum in Brazil or whatever um, You know, that's where I'd like to see the world go is that give people the chance to to break out of whatever molds They're in and the way to do that is to empower people and to reach out a hand and to help people ourselves And not to expect or to tax our way into doing that being taxed to help someone doesn't feel good at all no. But putting out your hand and raising somebody else up is the best feeling in the world. So, yeah, that's, um, I want to, to keep trying to figure out what makes people tick. And uh, I want to race a car around South America, make a lap around South America and come back. Okay. So little things like that. I can dig that Maybe one. play some tennis in between, you know. <laughs> Take a break on uh, Quito, Ecuador. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that'd be great, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I look forward to um, to living life, man. I appreciate it. Well, yeah. thank you, Brian. That was, uh, that was good. It's really nice to hear just a different perspective. Every yeah. Time. You, you, one other thing, you know, um, I'm an Atlantan, and in Atlanta we welcome everybody. So you guys come to Atlanta. This is a great city. Um, we, we're on the way up here big time. There's a huge energy here, uh, lots of opportunity. Uh, for filmmakers, for anybody in business, you, you come to Atlanta and we have, a, we have a very open attitude here and we're really excited about the way things are. And I hope I've, you know, shown that about this city because what a cool place to live. You know, there's a million places across the world to live and there's nowhere I'd rather call home. So, y'all come hear. visit anytime. <laughs> y'all come back now. Yeah, yeah all right. <laughs> Thanks, Heath. Cool, Thanks, cool man. man.